Uh, good afternoon, and uh, this is a it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Uh, Kim Kim Selting from Vietnam to come in to give this give this seminar. As I said, it's a, in a in a in a very short notice, but it's uh, it's great that that you agree to come in. Anyway, um, just a very brief introduction that uh, Prof Professor Selting got to complete her undergraduate study and the veterinary study at Colorado State University. And then she joined the faculty at the University of Missouri from 2002 or 2017. And in, 2000, in July 2017, and then uh, Professor Selting accepted our offer here at the University of Illinois to join our join the faculty at uh, the VetMed um, to develop a radiation therapy program. And I believe you are very, very much overseeing the process, getting this uh, new instrument coming in, this fantastic equipment coming to the, to the UI. And then the, and she's uh, currently associate professor at, at University of Illinois. And uh, Dr. Selting's research interest is including biomarkers for cancer and of chemotherapy toxicity and for novel anti-cancer drugs and the effect of radiation on tumor macro environments. So it's all very inter interesting, very interesting um, topics. And then among many of her professional activities, and uh, she is the immediate past president of the Veterinary Cancer Society, and also the past chair of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine Oncology Certifying Exam Examination Committee. And uh, yep, and uh, thank you very much for coming over. And thank you. okay, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to share some of uh, well, I guess a little bit about my my life. Um, I have, I'll, let me share my screen with you. All right, everyone can see that. Oops. Uh, let's see. I think I need to remove that now. Just trying to make it full screen for you. Let me try this one more time. I think what I have to do, I've done this once before. So do that, that, then show screen, and then I can pick that one. There. Okay. Now you should be able to see see my screen. Yep. Okay. Uh, so. I am, so I'm a veterinarian. So what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, a lot about my experience in veterinary oncology. I'm boarded in both uh, medical oncology and radiation oncology. And when I was on faculty at the University of Missouri, I was primarily functioning as a medical oncologist and um, then had always maintained a strong interest in radiation oncology. And so during my time there, I created a non-conforming or a non-alternative residency to, to get a second board certification in radiation oncology in 2013. And then, um, and then that brought me here to, to start a program here. So uh, I think hopefully an overarching theme of this talk will be the intersection of uh, human and animal medicine and the value, hopefully you'll get some appreciation for the value of animals as models of spontaneous disease because they are Tremendous, tremendously valuable um, models of, of uh, spontaneously occurring disease. Our animals share our environment. They have intact immune systems. They're genetically diverse. Um, they're just, it's a wealth of opportunities for study. And in the process, we get to also provide compassionate care to them. So, uh, so we'll talk a lot about that. Oops, there we go. So, um, oops. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit, I'll, I will reiterate a little bit of the introduction which I, Dr. Meng so graciously shared with you. We'll talk a little bit about radiation and radiation therapy physics against, I, um, or basics rather. I really ha don't have a great understanding of what everyone's background is, so I'm just going to do a few radiation basics as far as interaction with matter and, you know, and how that translates to the clinic and what we do in the clinic for radiation therapy that will lead naturally into a discussion of what resources we have here and what we use to do radiation therapy here for companion animals and then uh, how I'm going to use those uh, pieces of equipment to pursue some research interests. I've been here for about uh, three and a half years now. So um, 
I went to vet school in the nine, early 90s to be a horse vet because I grew up riding horses. That's my horse. And um, I, in vet school, develop, developed a real fondness for oncology because cancer medicine was just very exciting. I thought it was the ability to, you know, to help animals, to help people at the same time, I thought it was tremendous. And um, it was very creative and it was, you know, cancer is something that happens. And so uh, it was very rewarding to think that although I didn't give them cancer, I can do something about it. So um, I pursued an internship in New York City and then went into private practice for a little while and maintained a strong interest in oncology and then went back to Colorado State to do my medical oncology residency and then landed at Missouri as, as we discussed and did my radiation training there and then came here in 2017 to start a radiation oncology program. So they had prior to my arrival, they had already negotiated uh, getting a new machine. So we had a very old cobalt machine, which I have a picture to share with you. And we can talk just a little bit about that. But um, the plan was to go from, as I, as I like to say, from a tricycle to a Ferrari. Like we went from one of the older uh, units to one of the brand new units or the newest top of the line units that's used in people we, we have here for animals. So, uh, and we needed to build a clinical service. This was not something that we routinely offered. We offered, you know, just a little bit of radiation for palliation or easing of symptoms, if you will. Um, and just tremendous opportunities for research. So building all parts of this service is, is, is what I've been working on for the last few years and continue to work on. This also involves uh, training. So we'll have interns and in both medical and radiation oncology residents. I have my first radiation oncology resident right now. She's a little more than halfway through her first of two years. There are usually two to four year programs. I currently have a two year program here. Um, and then, you know, we, are, we just opened a search for a second radiation oncologist, the second one of me, so that we can grow even more. And then the last thing that was really something that I brought to the program that was not uh, part of the plan, if you will, is nuclear medicine. At the University of Missouri, we have a research reactor, so we did quite a bit of nuclear medicine there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences with that as well. So just to start with some radiation basics, again, this is just really to make sure we're sort of all on the same page and provide a little bit of um, how I describe, you know, radiation when I'm, when I'm teaching. So um, forgive me if some of this is rudimentary for some of you, but radiation, a good definition of radiation is the emission and propagation of energy through a space or a material medium. And so when we talk about ionizing radiation, we're talking about the ability to knock an electron out of orbit, and uh, that creates an electron and an ion pair. This creates uh, you know, radicals that will then interact with um, pr primarily with DNA, which is the primary target of uh, radiation therapy. Um, when we think about radiation, there are two main categories. There's electromagnetic radiation and particulate or particle radiation, particle-based radiation. Electromagnetic is packets of energy. So photons are packets of energy. It is the result of orthogonal fields of electric and magnetic fields that are forward moving and that packet of energy um, has, it has force, but it does not have mass or charge. And that's really important because when, as we learn about radiation, we have to understand how radiation interacts with matter and also uh, understand these characteristics because that is what allows us to create um, therapeutic machines and to use uh, radioisotopes and understand how they're interacting with with matter. So um, photons uh, constitute the, the electromagnetic spectrum, which ranges everywhere from radio waves to x-rays and gamma rays that are used for radiation therapy treatment. When we think about the difference between gamma rays versus x-rays, gamma rays originate from the nucleus. So this is, we use the term gamma ray when we're talking about radioisotopes versus x-rays, which originate outside the nucleus. And we usually use the term x-ray when it's something that, um, that a machine has generated. And, and we'll mention very briefly, I'll talk a little bit about how these machines work. When we talk about particle radiation or particulate radiation, these are going to be subatomic particles that have mass and might have charge. So electron has, is tiny, but has both mass and charge, which means we can do something to it. With a photon, I, my um, analogy is that a photon is like a gust of wind. It can knock you down, but you cannot, you cannot grab it or push it. You cannot uh, control it or make it go slower or faster. You can block it, but you cannot 
um, control it, if you will. So, um, but an electron is different. An electron has mass and charge, so we can use that to our advantage and use uh, magnetic fields to manipulate the electron, and that's that's how our therapeutic machines work. So, uh, neutrons are much more difficult to um, to handle because they don't have charge. So they have mass, but they don't have charge. So they're very difficult to uh, to manipulate. Protons, and there are proton therapy facilities throughout the United States and around the world, but not very many of them. They're very complicated and difficult and expensive to, um, to create. And then uh, heavy ion uh, facilities are even fewer. There's only a few of those. And heavy ions use uh, large particles. So an alpha particle is essentially the nucleus of a helium atom. And this is a form of radioactive decay that occurs in uh, radionuclides with very high atomic number. So a radioisotope is a is an atom that has an inappropriate balance of energy. So remember that the atom has nucle uh, nucleus filled with neutrons and protons. So you have something neutral and something positively charged, and then you have the electrons and concentric shells you know, around the nucleus uh, with a negative charge. So if that balance is inappropriate, then it will decay by releasing uh, either a beta particle, which is an, essentially an electron from the nucleus, it can decay by releasing a little packet of photon energy. If they're big, unstable uh, radioisotopes, they might release a whole, again, the equivalent of a helium atom or um, an alpha particle, and that's very large. So if it hits something, it packs a big punch. It does a lot of damage, and it does it causes a lot of damage to DNA as it passes through and causes a lot of do, uh, double strand breaks, which is the most lethal uh, damage that radiation can do to a cell. So, so alpha particles are used in, uh, in certain forms of therapy. There are alpha emitters, and if you can get the alpha particle to the cell of interest, then you can have a very selective impact on that. And there, one good example is a, is a drug called Zofigo, which is a um, it's an alpha emitter that's used in men with metastatic to bone prostate cancer. So it targets the bone lesion, and because it brings the uh, radioisotope there, as the radioisotope decays and releases these alpha particles, if it has landed in that bone lesion, then these alpha particles are going to really cause a lot of damage to the nearby cancer cells that are living in that bone. <clears throat> so we can exploit the biology of um, of a tumor or of the body to uh, have this effect. Uh, when we think about how, how um, photons interact with matter, the photoelectric effect is what we rely on for diagnostic imaging. So the top picture is a cat head using kilovoltage imaging. This is what we do for routine radiography. And you can see the, the beautiful detail between the bones and the soft tissues, and you can see the, uh, here's the canine teeth, the upper canine teeth, and the, this cat is missing a lower canine tooth, but here's the other one here. Here's the cheekbones here, and here's the bulla, and this is the skull here, and then the neck is down at the bottom. Um, the bottom image is of a cat head using megavoltage irradiation. So when you have lower energy photons, when they uh, interact with an electron, they give all their energy to the electron and eject it and it's absorbed. So it's going to result in differential absorption that something that is more dense is going to absorb more than something that is less dense. So where, you, where there is air, the photons are gonna make it through and expose the detector and where there is bone, they won't. And then that will leave a white uh, place where, you know, where the photons didn't make it through relative to the other photons in the field or x-rays in the field rather. So um, when we use megavoltage, uh, we rely on Compton scatter with higher energy. The photon will uh, eject the electron and the leftover energy continues and ejects other electrons. And that scatter of the fast, the, the consequential fast electrons hitting other electrons and the leftover photon hitting other electrons creates a lot of uh, where you deposit a lot of energy in that area. And um, that relies on the scatter, this Compton scatter. So for therapeutic radiation, we rely on the phenomenon of Compton scatter. And in this case, it is almost the same for uh, soft and hard tissue for bones as it is for soft tissue. So it's less important that, um, you know, that you know where the bone is and more important that you know where the tumor is. So here I promised a picture. So this is our old cobalt machine on the left here. And you can see that it's, it's relatively small compared to our new machine here, which is a varying true beam. The components of this are, uh, we call this the couch, the place where the patient lays down. 
and the gantry is where the radiation comes out of the head of the of the machine. So they, they have a similar shape. What's different is that um, this couch is secured to the floor and moves on a pedestal. This The cobalt one is not. This is not actually secured. Um, and this has a radioisotope, has cobalt-60 up in the gantry. And when you, when you leave the room and turn the beam on, a spring will relax and allow it to move over an aperture, an opening, and then the uh, gamma rays that are constantly being emitted will escape towards the patient in the shape of whatever field you have made. So you'll make a rectangle of some sort. And in, in, you know, in the old days, this had a rack on it where you could put, uh, you could even do a, a custom block there to try to shape the beam further beyond it being a, just a simple square or rectangle. You could make it have, uh, you know, you could block the corners or something if you had a critical structure there, like an eyeball that you didn't want to receive the radiation. So this is what I had when I came. Um, and then the linear accelerator is what we have installed in June of 2019 is when we started treating our patients. If one other really important uh, aspect of this machine is that you have these orthogonal uh, comb beam CT and detector here. So what this machine can do is uh, detect, you can do a, a, a CT scan with the patient in place on the table at the time of treatment and know exactly where your gantry is going to point when you turn the beam on. We also have a newer version of, or a newer form of quality assurance when we are checking our treatment plans. And this down here, the uh, electronic portal um, dosimeter down here is something that comes out and will catch what comes out of the gantry through the patient. And what uh, hits the detector will tell us, it can give us images of where that beam is hitting the patient. So all of these help us deliver very precise. Um, this is much more precise. The linear accelerator that we have now is is much more precise because we can shape our beam, we can modulate our energy, we can uh, go from all angles. The cobalt 60 will go from all angles, but this couch is not fixed, it's not pivoting on the floor. This one we can move to do non coplanar uh, beams so we can shift the couch over to the side and have the beam come into the patient from a different angle. What you see on the, on the couch here, we also have a perfect pitch couch and that means that this has six degrees of freedom. So what we do is we put our patient in this positioning cradle here, and then there's a little bite block here. This was a, a, a case with a tumor in the head. So we stabilize the head with this, um, this bite block, this plexiglass system with a little dental mold. And it, you can imagine that if, if all of your upper arcade or the teeth of your upper jaw are in the same location every time, then so is the rest of your jaw because it's all connected. So a bite block helps us precisely position the head if we're radiating the head. And then, um, then we take a, take a picture to know that they're in the same spot that they were when we did the CT scan and that when we turn the beam on, it is pointing at the same spot that we think it is based on the computer-based plan that we made. So we can use this machine for lots of different things. I've done a lot of cell culture since I started using it. Um, I've been irradiating uh, mice and rats for various research projects. Um, some of the other research that we're looking at is the interaction of the immune system and radiation. Uh, there's, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And also maybe looking at some basic concepts of radiobiology. Again, remember that uh, I started this talk reminding you that uh, companion animals, dogs, specifically dogs and cats, are excellent models of disease. They are our companions and we are doing things to help them. We are not doing things to them or for them that are you know, purely for research purposes. They have spontaneously occurring cancer and we are offering treatment that helps them. And if we pay attention to how they do with treatment, then we can learn things that advance cancer, the knowledge of cancer across the board and across all species. Um, animals also have a naturally accelerated aging process. So their lifespans are expected to be shorter. So if you wanted to investigate, for example, the effect of radiation on a certain tumor type or um, take samples to determine the effect on the environment, we can finish that in a dog in a year and it might take five to 10 years in people. That means that we get answers sooner in animals and it translates very well from cell culture to animal to a human, radiation does. Um, so we can get answers that really advance the knowledge of cancer 
across species years sooner and for much less money than what it costs to do in people. So lots of benefits of using dogs and cats as translational models. And the American Association of Physicists and Medicine has recognized that they do have a working group that uh, is focused on uh, trying to bring together physicists and radiation oncologists and human medicine with radiation oncologists and veterinary medicine so that we can ask and answer some very important questions that would be difficult to answer in a human being. Um, for various reasons. Um, so, uh, and again, this machine is being used for the clinical service for the treatment of pet cats and dogs. Uh, we treat a lot of uh, tumors that are difficult to access with surgery. So brain tumors, nasal cavity tumors, uh, incompletely resected uh, tumors like sarcomas. And also we use it for palliation of pain. So radiation can decrease the tendency to bleed. It can decrease the tendency to to be painful. So even if we're using radiation, we're not using radiation to cure the tumor, we can use some radiation to make it feel better and improve the quality of life of the patient. There's a lot of terms, there's a lot of um, acronyms and abbreviations in radiation oncology, and I'm not going to sort of laboriously read all of these, but basically stereotactic radiation therapy re uh, refers to the use of that image guided positioning. So using the orthogonal Home beam CT to verify your positioning at the time of treatment. That's a, a hallmark of stereotactic radiation therapy. The what we call fractionation. In other words, when we do radiation, we think of it as uh, a treatment divided into parts that make sense for the tumor that you're treating, the location that you're treating, and the nearby normal critical structures or organs at risk to be sure that you are getting as much radiation to the tumor as you can and as little radiation to the normal tissues as you can. Um, so we can do that very precisely with this, with stereotactic positioning. When we fractionate, when we have very precise delivery, when we can plan the delivery of radiation to be within a millimeter of uh, what is actually in the patient, which is true with this machine as submillimeter precision, then we can give more radiation at one time and, uh, and in fewer treatments and have a similar outcome to if we gave lots of little treatments, which is the conventional or traditional way to do radiation therapy. So when we're using stereotactic, there's a lot of different terms out there, but stereotactic body radiation therapy um, is, uh, is essentially the same thing as ablative radiation therapy. And intensity modulated radiation therapy is a term that's used to mean that when you're pointing a beam at one from one side, because typically we treat from multiple angles so that any one spot on the patient, whether it's a human or, or an animal, gets very little radiation, but they all converge upon the tumor. So the tumor gets all of the dose and everything nearby gets very little. With intensity modulated radiation, we are using um, a multi-leaf collimator, and I have something to share with you to show you how that works, where there's a series of uh, very, very narrow leaves. So in the center, they're two and a half millimeters with the high definition MLC that I have. And at the outer edges, they're five millimeters and those leaves will move in and out. And I, I have a little video to share with you here in a minute, but um, they will move in and out to create a shape of, to create the shape of the tumor. They can also move in and out while the beam is on. And that either can be done while the gantry is in one place with IMRT or while the gantry is moving, which is, is VMAT or volumetric modulated arc therapy. And when they're doing that, they, we have told the computer what everything is. We've done a CT scan, we have labeled everything. We have gone into this planning workspace and, and said, hey computer, here's an eyeball, here's a tumor, here's a brain. I want you to hit the tumor, don't hit the eyeball or the brain. And, uh, and it's an iterative process of either us creating options and seeing how we like the outcome. And the computer says, if everything you told me is true, here's how that's gonna work for you. Um, or we can do what's called inverse planning, which means that we tell the computer what our objectives and constraints are, which means we wanna get at least this much to the tumor and not more than this to the normal tissues. And then the computer goes through a series of, of um, iterations to try to find the best possible plan. And in doing that, they will use these leaves and slide the leaves in and out while the beam is on. And the purpose is to, to give a little more radiation here and a little less there and a little more here and a little less there and paint the dose so that you're getting radiation exactly where you want it based on what you've modeled for your plan. So um, when we talk about conformal dosing, we mean that the isodose lines, which means everything inside of a volumetric line or, or a volume is 
getting at least a certain dose and then you might have spots inside that are getting more, but the dose gets lower as you go outside of that line and, and reach a new sort of threshold or line of, um, of everything inside the new line is, is getting a certain dose and the dose drops off as you get farther away. So the more uh, you tailor the shape, the three-dimensional shape of your, of your isodose cloud, if you will, within the patient to the shape of your target, the more conformal it is. And there are um, calculations and indexes that we use to determine how conformal we are being. Um, and then I just described the IMRT to you. And image guided just means that we're using imaging to guide planning. Uh, it's used more often for you when we have this cone beam CT, but any kind of imaging technically is, uh, it helps you do image guidance rather than just looking at the patient using a light field and, and pointing and, and turning the machine on. Um, we talked about stereotactic, that it implies rigid positioning devices and using positioning verification of some sort, typically with, the, with something that is attached to the same machine at the same time that you're going to do the treatment. Um, and then with stereotactic treatment, the definition in, in the United States is, is one to five large doses given over a relatively short period of time, typically less than two weeks. In Europe, I believe it's up to seven doses. So that's based on insurance codes and, and how you know, how human medicine will, will pay for treatment. But the, the essence of stereotactic is you're giving a few big doses in a short period of time. And that has a different effect on the tumor than traditional uh, radiation where we give lots of little doses over time. And it, when we do traditional radiation, we're trying to allow certain tissues like nerves to repair every day, but the tumor doesn't have that same capability. And the accumulation of radiation damage in a tumor has a sum effect, a net effect on the tumor, whereas that radiation over time on the normal structures, it can be compensated for and you have very little damage. So, um, so and then stereotactic radiosurgery is, is a term that's used for the head versus Stereotactic body radiation therapy or SABER is, uh, is for the rest of the body. So when you do stereotactic radiation therapy or SBRT, uh, you are um, using again, high dose for fraction and there are consequences to the tumor type as well. Some tumor types also have a high ability or an enhanced ability to repair DNA damage and they have what we call an alpha beta ratio that is low. And the alpha beta ratio is, is defined at the point, the point at which the direct and indirect killing are equal of a cell. So, do, so directly damaging strands of DNA, ideally double-stranded break that leads to a lethal, um, a lethal insult to the cell um, versus indirect means that you have uh, lots of single-stranded breaks and eventually in some cells that adds up to a, to a lethal damage to the cell. But there are some tumor types that um, are, are like a neuron. They have a high ability, high capability to repair. And so if you're trying to treat that tumor type, you actually need these big fraction sizes because that's harder to repair. So uh, it will also, if you have something critical nearby, like if you're trying to treat an osteosarcoma, which is a primary bone tumor that is right next to the brain, then um, if you get too much dose over to the brain, those brain cells are not going to be able to cope with that, um, but neither are the osteosarcoma cells. So, but that's where the conformality comes in. That's where being very, very precise will help us deliver the radiation that we want to the tumor and not to the adjacent brain. Osteo in dogs, osteosarcoma and prostate have been uh, suspected of and, and cell culture work would suggest that they have a low alpha beta ratio similar to um, similar to those diseases in humans. So again, more evidence for the use of animals as models of disease. Typically, we treat the GTV. It is traditional to put, I didn't, I didn't include all those terms, but GTV is gross tumor volume, and PTV is planning target volume. And it's still traditional to put a small planning target volume around your tumor um, to make sure that any little uh, extensions or, or changes on a day-to-day -day -day basis are captured in your uh, in your treatment field. Um, but we use this, the biologically equivalent dose is a formula that we use to try to um, understand what the impact of the radiation dose that we're using is on the tissues and that can help us design our protocols for a given patient in a given tumor. Uh, the BED for um, 
acutely responding tissues, so cells that have high turnover and heal by replacement, like your skin cells or the lining of your, your mucous membranes uh, is usually very high versus late responding tissues is very low. So, and again, that has to do with graphing the intersection of, um, of direct versus indirect damage from radiation to the DNA. Um, so some things that we consider when we're using stereotactic are, uh, you know, which tumors might be more uh, amenable or appropriate to treat stereotactic radiation. Sometimes slow growing tumors um, might not be best treated by lots of fractionation because they're not, they're not proliferating very, uh, very rapidly. And so they might benefit from having a larger dose at a time and, and a really a, an intense, um, fractionation schedule, so doing it over a very short period of time. Uh, the other thing that has been recognized is that when we are treating with traditional or conventional fractionation, lots of little doses over usually about four weeks in human medicine up to four to six weeks, um, we are primarily causing this accumulation of damage in the DNA when we uh, of the tumor cells. When we are using stereotactic, we have a very significant effect and perhaps even the predominant anti-tumor effect is because of the effect on the blood vessels, which are late responding tissues and they are very much damaged by large fraction size. So the vascular response and effects is a big part of the anti-tumor effects of the stereotactic radiation. Um, and then we use some guidelines to help us know if we are achieving our goals, um, it is not uncommon to see uh, the dose distribution being very inhomogeneous. If you remember that those leaves are sliding in and out to make sure that overall we're getting enough radiation into the tumor, that might mean that we have some hot spots and some cold spots, which is a little bit different than traditional radiation where we try to make it relatively homogeneous so that the effects are pretty uniform. Um, so some of the resources that we have here are, uh, again, the, the Truebeam Linear Accelerator. I have a list of the uh, capabilities. It has dual energy photons. We have multiple electrons and we can treat with electrons superficially um, for more superficially located tumors with excellent sparing of deep, deep structures. I can adjust my dose rate. Um, that's, been, that's something that has been very interesting to me. And I think I have some, uh, a slide on this in just a little bit about some work that I did looking at dose rate because um, the time, the duration of delivery of radiation can impact the way that tissues respond. If you give radiation with a very low dose rate, so if I give a dose of radiation over an hour instead of over two minutes, the biologic effect is very different. So um, dose rates of less than a gray per minute are going to result in uh, potentially increased ability for normal tissues to repair, maybe not necessarily tumor tissues. And so we can um, you know, potentially exploit that. So one of the things that I was interested in, because when I came here, the cobalt machine was very old and it had decayed to the point where there's not a whole lot of radiation, radioactive, there's a lot of radioactivity left in it, but relatively speaking, there's much less than there used to be. And so the dose rate is very low. It's at a, right now it's at less than 25 centigrade per minute or a fourth of a gray per minute. So that's a very low dose rate. And at that level, you would expect uh, some tissues to be able to repair themselves during, during the dose of radiation that you're delivering. And that could include some tumor tissues. It could also have different, uh, a different impact on the tumor microenvironment, which includes blood vessels, stroma, um, and immune effector cells to, are, the, are the big three components of the tumor microenvironment that are very relevant to how a tumor responds to radiation. So um, we have, uh, I have the onboard imaging, we have the multi-leaf collimator. Um, I can do stereotactic radiation with either cones, which are very precise. They make a little sphere of radiation with very rapid drop off of dose and uh, sparing of the nearby tissues or with my multi-leaf collimator to be able to accommodate any shape and size. Um, we do have this, uh, this EPID uh, specific quality assurance for our patient plans. And we have both physical and dynamic wedges so that can further modulate a beam as you're uh, going through a treatment. And then the newest addition, and this is something I'm very excited about is we have a, a respiratory gating for scanners camera. So it's an RGSC camera from Varian, who is the, that's who makes the TrueBeam. Um, and we have motion management on our TrueBeam machine, which means that I can now, as of just a month ago, I can collect 
a, a planning CT with respiratory gating. So we put a little sensor on the patient and it tells a camera when the patient is breathing and it will collect uh, CT images at all phases of the respiratory cycle. And it will tell me, you took this picture when the patient was in, inspiring or you took this picture when the patient was expiring or on expiration. And I can do a treatment plan based on only treating when you're in a certain phase of the respiratory cycle, usually on expiration when, because that's where you spend most of your, more of your time is spent in expiration. If you think about yourself breathing in, you sort of breathe in, breathe out, then you might pause for a minute. And then a little bit later you breathe in, you breathe out. So your expiration is a longer part of your respiratory cycle. So we can deliver more radiation during that time. So typically we do a planning process that allows us to, to uh, turn our machine on. Our machine will automatically turn on when the patient is in a certain phase of the respiratory cycle. Because of that, we can be even more precise, very, very directed, very specific to treat uh, something like a lung mass and not, you know, that's moving with respiration, but um, not really hit hardly any of the nearby uh, lung tissue. One other thing I wanted to mention is that we have a strontium uh, applicator. So strontium-90 is a radioisotope that is a little nugget of radioactivity housed at the tip of a rod. With the, and I have a picture of this, of a plexiglass uh, shield, and you can, and it gets a lot of radiation to the first two to three millimeters. So, and then it, because it's a beta emitter, um, it will, those, those particles don't go very far. They're, they're essentially, they're electrons that are emitted from the nucleus. So they uh, have mass and charge and start to interact with matter and they slow down very quickly and they run out of steam and there's no energy that goes deep to that. So you can get a, a lot of radiation to very superficial lesions. So in situ or above the basement membrane kind of lesions. So um, this is the probe so that I mentioned here. So the, the radioactive substance is here in this little chamber. This has a shield on it. Actually, we take that off for treatment. And then this is my hand holding it. And I touch that to the area of interest. And um, in addition to that, we have other uh, radiation, other nuclear medicine capabilities that will probably be coming soon. We still have our cobalt machine. It's supposed to have been removed way back when, but because of COVID and just the government pace of things and, and a variety of different scheduling reasons, we still have it and they're hopefully gonna come take it away soon. When the cobalt machine goes away, we're gonna convert the cobalt vault into um, a radiation isolation ward so that we can do more nuclear medicine. And some of the, of the uh, radioisotopes that I've had experience with are high dose radioiodine for thyroid tumors in dogs. We do low dose for, radio, for um, hyperthyroidism in cats, but for dogs, we can do a, a high dose, but requires special licensing because iodine can get into our people and can go to our thyroid. So you have to be very careful with it, uh, with handling it. Uh, 10, one, one, oh, that should be 117. Metastable is a is a radioisotope that decays by internal conversion and it is has been used intraarticular for arthritis in some work that I did at Missouri. Um, we've published one paper and have another one coming out. Um, Samarium uh, 153 DOTMP is also, uh, it's a newer form of a drug called Quadramet, which was EDTMP. That was the chelant that held the radioisotope and brought it to the bone. The P is phosphorus, so it takes it to the bone. And then uh, yttrium-90 is, um, is a beta emitter with a higher energy beta particle than strontium-90. And uh, that has been, I've worked with a company that has suspended it in the colloid and we're able to inject it in directly into the tumor. So a few quick fun pictures. This is pumpkin. Pumpkin had squamous cell carcinoma, the nasal planum. So it was very uh, extensive, but also very superficial. And so we treated with strontium just by touching this applicator to the lesions on the nose. Also, there was a little one starting on the eye. You can see it uh, sort of juicy there. Um, and then, and we had complete regression of this mass. And here's pumpkin awake at the time of the initial biopsy there. And then uh, after we've treated, and there was a little scar left behind there that just sort of stayed, but this stayed away for the rest of this cat's life uh, until we didn't hear from them anymore. This is a really interesting case. We use strontium. We usually can't do it on dogs because their tumors are too too thick, and you, but this was very superficial. And in this dog, the tumor tissue is all along the underside of the tongue here, and there were some little patchy spots around. This was, we, I treated this with strontium. This was just two weeks later. It's all quiet and flat. And this dog occasionally has a new spot come up and we have 
repeated treatment over the last, or almost, I think we're two years out now. So this dog came to us because they had been told that they had to remove their dog's tongue if they wanted their dog to live. And they were seeking other options and we were able to, um, to do that. And it's really been great for this dog. So uh, I think I'm watching my time a little bit. I think I'll try to save some time for some questions, but so I'm gonna buzz through maybe in the next, maybe eight minutes or so, I'll go through some of my research interests. And some of these will tie back into some of the concepts that I've already shared with you. So they maybe will sound familiar, but uh, one of the things that we're interested in looking at is radio immunotherapy. So when you irradiate tissues, you can do a number of things. You can shift the T cell populations in the tissues, you can, um, which can, correlate with or correspond to uh, tumor surveillance. So you might uh, favor macrophage and T cell uh, activation against tumor cells. You also, if tumors undergo what's called immunogenic cell death, which means that they die in a way that they release um, stimulants to the immune system, that can create what's known as an abscopal effect, which means that if you irradiate a local tumor, you could heighten the immune system's response to the cells that are there and therefore make them make the immune system better at finding those cells in the rest of the body and actually have a systemic uh, response to the localized radiation. I don't think that ha that probably doesn't happen very often all by itself just with radiation, even though you start to you know, damage cells and release antigens and potentially release these mediators of immunogenic cell death. Um, but if we can combine that with something that augments that response and says, hey, immune system, pay attention, um, we could potentially do a, a lot of uh, good for systemic control of the, of the cancer. Um, we uh, can also, we also are looking at mouse models of bone cancer. Bone cancer is a, is a very well accepted model now in dogs because it, it's about 10 times more common in dogs than it is in people. And in people, it's an adolescent disease. The median age is usually around 14 years old. And so it's, you know, teenagers and young adults are getting bone cancer. And then some older folks, especially men in their 60s can get uh, osteosarcoma. But, um, but the behavior, the molecular aspects, the response to therapy are all very, very similar in people and in dogs. And in dogs, we see, uh, you know, eight to 10 times as much uh, as many of these cases per year. So they're a very robust model for study, for cancer study. Melanoma is the poster child of, of immunotherapy because it's a very immunogenic tumor. Um, and so, and it is a tumor that responds to radiation. So is there a role for using radiation to uh, create an immune response and combining that with, um, you know, with immunotherapy? There is a, a vaccine that's available against canine melanoma that was developed on a xenogenic vaccine concept so that it could correlate across, it could translate across species. Um, and then the, there's so many questions though. There's things that need to be answered about what is the effect of the dose? What's the right dose to get an immune response? What's the right dose rate? What's the interfraction interval, interval? How often do you give the radiation? How many do you, do you, how many fractions do you give? What kind of energy and does, is that a factor? So these are all things that have been, uh, are being explored now. And some of that is the dose rate specifically is something that I'm very interested in. And uh, again, I'm very interested in the effect of radiation on the tumor microenvironment. And for this, my research ha uh, is mostly, has mostly been in collaborations. I've been working with folks on campus uh, to determine the intersection between uh, ultrasound and radiation therapy. So is, is there some um, effective ultrasound that could change the way radiation interacts with the tissues? Uh, is there, tumors are inherently stiff and uh, radiation can uh, contribute to that. So does it change, does radiation change the behavior of the tumor because it changes the microenvironment by changing the stiffness of the tumor? Um, have some work going with gliomas, with primary brain tumors, and, and some others. So again, those are mostly just collaborations, but something I'm very interested in. Uh, this was a study that I did with one of my summer students, with, and we looked at, we, we picked a few relevant immune effectors. So MHC class one is is what tells the immune system what's inside a cell. And so uh, we wanted to look to see if, if when we irradiated cells at different dose rates, was there a different effect on the um, transcription of these molecules? So uh, fast ligand is used in uh, a counterattack to attack lymphocytes. 
Um, PDL1 also uh, inhibits antigen recognition. So these are all relevant to, those would be relevant to checkpoint inhibitors where if you, uh, if you have, if the tumor is suppressing the immune response against it, you can use a checkpoint inhibitor to, to stop that, to not allow the tumor to suppress the immune system. And therefore the immune system is able to effectively target, attack and destroy the, the cancer cell. And checkpoint inhibitors are, have been a, a huge um, uh, area of, of uh, growth in cancer therapy and human medicine and, and is coming to veterinary medicine as well. Um, and then again, we, we chose one that would be some kind of signal to the immune system that the cell was dying. And that's so the HMGB homeobox protein is the one that we looked at. So we took some osteosarcoma and melanoma cells. We treated them all with eight grade, but we did variable dose rates at uh, 2,400 or 1,000 centigrade per minute. And then we uh, collected their, we did RT-PCR to look for changes in gene expression. And um, I only, I just included a few results here, but one thing that we found is that MHC expression in uh, the melanoma cells did seem to increase at 24 hours. Uh, so that it was interesting. You, you know, with radiation, you likely create neoantigens. You cause some damage to the DNA that can cause a mutation which can result in the translation to novel tumor antigens or neoantigens that are, that are associated only with the tumor. So, you know, so again, this idea of radio immunotherapy of, of creating an environment where you're modifying the environment, you're modifying the tumor cell and you might be killing the tumor cell, but you also might be modifying how the immune system is interacting with the, with the tumor there and in other parts of the body. This was the most dramatic change that we saw. And we have since repeated this, but, um, Fast ligand had dramatic increase in expression in the osteosarcoma cells. Unfortunately, there's not good antibodies to look at this uh, on a Western to see if this translated to protein expression, but we're still toying with how we might you know, better do that. In this, in this run, in this experiment, there was about 75 fold increase at the highest dose rate. And you can see there's a pretty big uh, dramatic difference between the lower dose rates and the higher dose rate. Um, so could we use high dose rate radiation and use a fast ligand um, uh, you know, molecule or a, uh, uh, antibody to try to augment the response to radiation therapy or change the way that the body responds to that tumor. We repeated this and got a much more modest increase, more like sevenfold, but still this pattern was there. And so that's something that we're interested in continuing to look at. Um, the, another interest of mine is oligometastatic disease. So in human medicine, I'm going to flip ahead just a quick second. In human medicine, they have uh, something called the COMET trial, which is, uses ablative radiotherapy to treat uh, limited metastatic disease. So historically, when cancer metastasizes, you sort of throw up your hands and say, well, now, now we're done because it has successfully made it to another part of the body, set up shop somewhere else. Now it's beyond our control and we cannot cure this tumor. And, uh, but the newer thinking is that those metastatic lesions can be the source of additional metastatic lesions. And so if we treat, if they don't have too many, if they just have a few in the first comet trial, just looked at, I think fewer than three. And you can see these, if you're familiar at all with Kaplan-Meier uh, graphs, when they, when, they, when they diverge like this, it means that there's a difference between the groups. So there was a really big difference between the groups, between patients who uh, didn't have their tumor treated with radiation, their metastatic lesions treated with radiation and patients that did. They did better if they had um, their metastatic lesions treated with uh, radiation. Uh, in veterinary medicine, there are cer certain tumor types that are regionally um, metastatic, but not, uh, not as systemically met so uh, metastatic. This is a, a dog's abdomen. So this is the beginning of the pelvis, the wings of the pelvis here. And then this is the lower spine. And then the, in orange, I've highlighted where a metastatic lymph node was. This was a dog that had a tumor near uh, the scent gland, near the anus, the, the anal, apocrine gland, anal sac adenocarcinoma that had metastasized to a few lymph nodes in the lower abdomen or lower, just in the, like, by the lower back, but nowhere else. And so we treated this dog aggressively and, and it went away completely. This is the same uh, level of dog. In other words, here's the pelvis here. There is nothing in this area. This is actually the bladder here. It might be a little bit misleading, but this is the tumor here and there is nothing here. So this dog has done very, very well. So can we, could we take from human medicine and translate that back to our animal 
um, patients and improve their outcome by treating uh, select patients where we have, we have good case selection and if we treat some of the metastatic disease, can we slow the progress of the disease? Or in some cases, if they only have, if the metastatic behavior only made it to one spot and you treat that spot, could we still hope for cure by getting really aggressive with radiation therapy? Um, this is the little sensor I talked about gating. This is the little sensor. It looks like a hippo to me. Some people call it a frog, but you put that on the patient. In this case, it's a human, but of course, mine are have, uh, walk on four legs. This is an image that we collected with a dog that had a tumor in the chest wall. On This is a dog. This, this was collected with gating on our CT scanner with this system. So we're just getting up and running with this, but very excited to do some research in this area. And I think it could be a good um, model for potentially for treating human lung cancer or to humans with lung cancer are treated with this already. Um, but for us to be able to contribute to the discussion or to the conversation, try to answer some basic questions about whether one protocol is better than another, that's something you could do very quickly in dogs that you could not do easily, quickly, or cheaply in people. But we can do it very uh, affordably um, and get robust results in dogs in a very short period of time. Um, just recently, I treated a couple of cats that did not have cancer that had benign disease. So low dose radiation has been used in chronic inflammatory situations. And when I was at Missouri, we used intraarticular tin, radioactive tin to uh, treat arthritis. And, and that had a, had a very nice effect. So that might be something that we get up and running here as well once I have an isolation area. Uh, but this is a very low dose, but they, so far these, both of these cats have had a beautiful response. They're both, their arthritis is much, much better and their GI tract is much better as well where they had uh, chronic inflammation, chronic inflammatory bowel disease. So I'd like to do more of that as clinical research. A lot of what I do is clinical research. I am, uh, I do have some things that I'd like to answer in the lab or using cell culture, but more I think of what I do is as, a, as a clinician scientist and as a clinical researcher. Um, Satchaplan, I can see that I'm probably getting to the end of time, but I think I'm pretty close to the end. Uh, this is just a, a novel chemotherapy drug that I did some work with, and this was a dog that I treated that had a tumor here of the jaw, and after treatment, it completely went away here. But these platinum drugs are really potent radiosensitizers. So, you know, with as conformal as we can be with my new equipment, could we use this drug that I have a unique experience with and combine it with radiation to have an improved uh, response to radiation just in the area where I irradiate? Um, and again, this is a picture from the research reactor at uh, Missouri. We did a lot of work with PET scanning. This is just a dog, um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna be a little bit quick about this, but this is a dog that had, a, had had radiation therapy for a soft tissue sarcoma of the elbow. This, these are elbows, it's the right leg and the left leg, as if you're shaking hands with them. And if you can see here, it's darker than it is in the corresponding part of the bone here. So there was a tumor here and we didn't know because we had done radiation a few years before this, we didn't know if this uh, lack of mineral related to loss of bone because of a late effect of radiation. So in other words, dead bone, or was it a radiation induced tumor and was it a bone tumor? And we answered that question with, and you really couldn't see it very well on other radiographs. We answered that question with a PET scan. We did a PET scan and we um, found this very hot area of activity right where that was on the elbow. Here's a better picture with the dog's head, forelimbs, and leg. And based on this scan, we amputated the leg. We didn't do a biopsy because it was consistent with active disease and radiographically it looked like a tumor. And it was indeed a radiation-induced osteosarcoma. Um, for therapy, again, I've done the work with the Cinevite and I've done high dose radioiodine in, in dogs with thyroid cancer. I've used yttrium uh, 90. I used it in a, a rhinoceros, which I have a picture of that to share with you next. Um, and then Cyclosam is uh, the newer version of, um, of Quadramat, which is a bone seeking radioisotope. So it is, it has a chelant that will carry it to the bone and then it has a radioisotope that will release radiation when it gets there. And this was one of the dogs that I treated. This was just a technetium scan to show where the tumor was on this. Uh, this was an Akita and this is a distal limb. So this is the wrist of the dog is right about here. And this is where the tumor is. It's very commonplace for osteosarcoma in dogs. And after we treated with the cyclosam, we did a scan to see where it landed and it landed right in the same spot, actually very robustly. It was it really landed there very well. 
Um, here's Layla. This is she's a rhino up at the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, and she had a chronic inflammatory lesion, a polyp in her uh, sinus and in her nasal cavity that was obstructing her breathing. So this is me, and I'm injecting this um, yttrium 90 and a colloid into. We pre-placed a whole bunch of catheters at uh, strategic uh, points and at uh, distance to create a brachytherapy field and had everything all hooked up. And then once everything was hooked up, then for radiation safety, you want to be around the radioactivity is for as short a time as possible. So in this shielded syringe, once everything was ready, I came over and injected, you know, boom, 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 and all of these and the same over here. And she had a really nice response. She still has some tissue there that's a little bit too deep for us to reach that they're dealing with. But um, most of that cavity that was inflamed and, and chronically irritated and causing her trouble um, did get better. Um, biomarkers, this is actually my last thing to mention, but um, I have also been very interested in biomarkers, something that we can use to either detect or monitor cancer. I've done uh, work with cardiac troponin I as a marker of cardiac or heart damage from certain chemotherapy drugs, specifically doxorubicin. And I've looked at thymidine kinase as a marker of proliferation to see if you could use it as a screening test for cancer in an otherwise apparently healthy uh, patient. That's been done in people and I've looked at it in dogs. And then at, right now I'm, I'm getting back to this interest of looking at exhaled breath condensate. And this is a dog, this dog is not sedated. It's just lying there politely and is comfortable. And we have this um, mask around its face. And as it's breathing in, the air is going in through this tubing and through a condenser was essentially a chemistry condenser with ice water circulating in the outer chamber. And inside it will collect pools of the condensate, just like if you breathe out on a cold morning. And in that we breathe out, I mean, now more than ever, everyone can appreciate that we breathe out important things, i.e. COVID, right? So we breathe out a lot of stuff and um, you can detect uh, cell-free DNA and you can detect both volatile and um, and stable compounds, um, organic and inorganic compounds. We breathe out whole bacteria. So the question is, do we breathe out any markers of you know, of cancer. And so this is something that there's not a ton of work in this area, but something that I've done some work with and I'm interested in, in looking at a little bit more and combining that with my respiratory gating. So what I want to do is get dogs with lung tumors, look at what's in their breath, and then use respiratory gating to treat their lung tumors in a very precise way with stereotactic radiation therapy. So that's how I'm kind of bringing those two parts of my world and my history together. So so that was a little bit rushed at the end and I went a little bit over and I do apologize, um, but I will take questions, whatever questions we have time for, I'm happy to answer. This is um, Garden of the Gods. This is where I, I grew up in Colorado and Colorado Springs, not too far from here. Garden of the Gods and Pikes Peak was always, always overlooking. So um, so that's that was my first home and the Midwest has been my second home. So I will stop there and stop screen sharing to make it a little bit easier to do question and answer. Okay, great. Thank you very much. It's a very nice, uh, very nice talk and a lot of possibilities uh, which are being brought up by this, uh, by this recent development of the... Okay, so we, I believe we have a few questions. We probably have time for a few quick questions. And uh, Carly, do you have a question? I saw a few people raised this. Yeah. Um, Sorry, now I'm just clapping. Great talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. you bet. Yes. Um, if there's no question, I have a quick question to... Um, um, in the in the current process, the current uh, procedure carried out at VetMed. So, do you what do you do to follow the therapeutic response? Uh, so, when we treat cats and dogs with tumors, yes, we follow them out. Depends on where the tumor is. If it's somewhere where we can see and feel, then we just get them back in at regular intervals. Usually, every three months, we'll have them back to to palpate. Like I had a dog that had one on the jaw where you could easily you know see it or feel it, and so you just would do a careful palpation. Typically, what I recommend is that. Um, we do, we repeat a CT scan about two to three months after the end of radiation therapy or after we, after radiation therapy. And the reason is that you can tumor, because, um, because the way that radiation works is in part to damage DNA and those cell, most cells undergo a mitotic death, um, not an intermitotic death. So they, so the cell has to try to divide and fail to divide and then collapse and be cleared away. Uh, because of that, we can see tumor cells that um, disappear over weeks and even months. And thyroid tumors are a great example. It's a very uh, 
slow growing tumor. And when we treat with radiation, we have a nice response, but sometimes they can just keep shrinking for months. They just continue to get smaller. But by three months, usually most tumors have the bulk of their response in that first three months. So, um, so I allow some time for tumor shrinkage, for normal tissue remodeling. And then I recommend that we do a CT scan so that we have a new baseline, so that we understand what the tumor looked like after we did radiation. And in most cases, it's smaller or at least stable where it was growing and now it has stopped growing. And then we know what to expect. We say, okay, it didn't, like some brain tumors don't get, don't get a lot smaller. They get a little bit smaller and the dogs feel a lot better because they got a little bit smaller, but that you just have this dormant little nugget of tissue that doesn't necessarily go away. Um, and then we know what to look for. So if that dog with a brain tumor has a seizure in a year, we can do an MRI or, or a CT, CT scan and look. And if the tumor is the same size, then that seizure might be a late effect of radiation, like a little scar on the brain there, or it could be related to something else, but it's not related to tumor progression because we have our, our baseline after radiation to say, hey, this one's just dormant. So we so a combination of physical examination and imaging when appropriate. And I, again, I usually will push for at least one follow-up after, um, you know, after that, um, that treatment. Okay. Well, thank you. There's another quick question. It's, uh, for example, a uh, flash radiography. It sounds like a hot topic in here. So is there any, uh, so is the true beam system that we're having here offering something similar, it's offering this capability? Yeah, we're not, we don't do flash radiotherapy here. That's like ultra high dose rates. And um, I, my, my highest dose rate is 1400 um, monitor units per minute or 14 gray per minute. And uh, flash radiotherapy, I think, is in the like 30 to 100 gray or something per minute. I, I have not done a, a lot of reading. I know what it is, but I'm, we can't do that here um, with this machine. Um, so that's not something that I've spent a lot of time on yet. Okay, great. Yep. Well, thank I you very much. One little, I was going to share just really fast. I'll share this little quick video I took of... Um, this is just a, a video that I took today of the the um, MLC. So this is just to demonstrate how I how I shape my beam and modulate my beam. These are the central leaves, which are two and a half millimeters. These are five millimeter leaves, and um, when so when it's moving, so the machine is moving around the patient, and these leaves are sliding in and out while the machine is moving around the patient. And radiation is only escaping through this darker area here. So we have this patient on the table, a dog on its back with its legs back here. And we're, we're radiating uh, it's the underside of its neck. So as the machine is moving, um, these leaves are sliding in and out and only allowing uh, radiation through. At any given angle, you're getting a different shape to, uh, to your beam so that it all adds up to what you want it to be. I just wanted to share that real quick. Yeah, fascinating. Very, very, very nice example. Okay. Well, if we don't have actual question, I uh, wish probably conclude here. And thank you very much, Kim. Thank you very much again for presenting this fascinating. Thanks work. for inviting me. If you have any other questions, just track me down. Yes. Well, thank you very much. And thanks everyone.